Good morning. Welcome back to our Patent Literacy Symposium and this session, Teaching Summarizing to Support Comprehension and Develop Writing Skills. My name is Karen Deary, and I'm joined this morning by my colleague, Dr. Amanda Sapola. We're so excited to facilitate this session for everyone, but before we start, we just have those few housekeeping items that we want to review for you. Remember that you can access the presenter handouts for this session, the presenter bio, and the conference schedule on the patent website, and the link, <clears throat> excuse me, is provided in the chat for you. We also want to ask you specifically to download the handouts for this morning. There are some handouts in there that um, our presenter will be referencing, and you'll want to have those at your fingertips. So um, please take a look at those. As a reminder, this session is being recorded and is 75 minutes in length, which includes a um, question and answer period at the end. So please share your questions in the chat box and we will collect those and share those with our presenter at the end of the presentation. To access closed captioning, click on the icon CC live transcript on the Zoom control panel. If you experience technology difficulties, please go to the technical support guides or, um, area above the schedule on the symposium page. We have disabled your microphones and cameras for this session. We ask you to keep those turned off just to eliminate any potential distractions during the presentation portion. We would love for you to tweet out about all of the learning you've been um, gathering this week on your social media platforms using the hashtag PatentLit2022. And now it's my honor and my privilege to welcome and introduce all of you to our presenter this morning, Joan Sedita. Joan? Thank you. Um, and thank you to Patan for giving me this opportunity to talk about a subject and a, a strategy that I, I, I just love. Um, I also had an opportunity earlier in the week to do a session uh, about the writing rope, and I'm, I'm just so delighted to be part of this. So uh, just very briefly, a little bit about um, of my background. Um, I've been edu in education since the mid 1970s. Um, I worked at a, the Landmark School for Children with Learning Disabilities for 23 years. And then uh, after 1998, started training teachers in a variety of situations. Uh, and about 15 years ago, started Keys to Literacy. So that's a little bit about my background. Uh, we're gonna be talking today about summarizing. Um, and, but before we do that, I want to sort of, sort of set the stage with big, a big picture and talk a little bit about where summarizing fits in to a framework that I developed a few years ago um, called the writing rope. Um, it's sort of a nod to Scholars Harbor, Scarborough's uh, reading rope. Um, but you know, I've often felt that when it comes to writing, uh, a lot of teachers aren't really sure what are the components. When you say, what are the five components of reading? You know, everybody can pretty much rattle them off, right? Phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, comprehension, right? You know, they've been with us since 2000 when the National Reading Panel used that schema. But often with teachers, writing is like this sort of just big blob of a topic. And uh, teachers aren't really sure what, what if we were draw, uh, pulling together a good curriculum for writing, or if we were vetting a writing program, what are the components we should make sure it has? So I'm just gonna start by hitting the mountaintops of that. Um, I organized the writing skills and strategies and techniques that teachers should be teaching um, into five major categories. The first is critical thinking. And under that, I put any skills or strategies that are involved with generating ideas or gathering information from sources when we are writing about what we're learning or what we're reading. And that's where summarizing is gonna fit in today. Uh, I also put in there the writing process, making sure that students know that we need to go through the stages of thinking and planning and writing and revising and that all those stages are important. So that's the first part of the rope. The second is syntax or sentence level. Um, lots of students, especially those who enter middle and high school who still struggle with writing, sometimes the problem breaks down right at that ability to write a good quality sentence. And so any instructional practices we would do that are designed to develop syntactic awareness, that is awareness of the, the grammar of the language, um, things such as sentence combining and sentence scrambles and um, sentence elaboration to have students be able to write longer sentences. 
that gets tucked in under there, as well as punctuation. The third is text structure. And text structure really covers, it's an umbrella for several things. On the broadest level, we're talking about text structure for the major types of writing, narrative, informational, and opinion or, or argument. So how do those uh, develop? How do the body of those develop? How are they similar, different? What about introductions and conclusions? Um, next level down in text structure is paragraph. And there are, uh, just like with sentences, many students who do not have solid paragraph skills as they enter middle and high school grades. So what activities and strategies can we teach students to know what a paragraph is and to write high quality paragraphs? Um, you know, so far the sentences, if we're working on developing sentences, that's going to help students with their summaries. And if we're teaching them about paragraph structure and main ideas that drive paragraphs, that's also going to support summary writing. Um, within the text structure, I think we also need to pay attention to what I call patterns of organization. And those are, you know, the main ones are description, sequence, cause and effect, so on and so forth. And then also these really important words, transitions that are phrases or words that we use to connect sentences, connect paragraphs, and then connect larger chunks of text. So those are the first three strands in the rope. The fourth is writing craft or writer's moves. Uh, this includes everything from word choice that students use, especially if they're aware of the audience that they're writing to, the task and the purpose of the writing. We wanna make sure that students understand that awareness of those things should have an effect on many of the choices they make when they're writing. I also tucked in under here literary devices. So that can include things such as how do you use dialogue um, to get across what's on the minds of your characters in a narrative piece? How do you use simile and metaphor and other, um, uh, other uh, devices like that? Allegory, flashbacks. So that's writing craft. The one thing I wanna say about writing craft is the best way to teach students certain writing craft techniques is to use mentor models or samples of good writing, quality writing that incorporates a technique or a strategy so that students can emulate it. And that's gonna be true with summarizing, which we're focusing on here today. It's really helpful to show students what good quality summaries look like that they can then emulate. Then finally, the last strand in the road is transcription skills. Um, and very often the instruction for this really should be taking place, especially in the early grades, in a phonics lesson, right? As students are learning to spell um, at the same time that they're learning to decode words, handwriting, keyboarding. The, the one point takeaway I want you to have when you think about transcription here is that if students enter fourth grade and their spelling is not sufficient, right? The, or their handwriting and keyboarding is still labored. It's not fluent, right? It's going to have effect, an effect on students' writing. It's very similar to if we think about reading. If students' decoding is not fluent, right, and they're struggling to read the words on the page, what happens? They don't have the energy to focus on comprehension and making meaning. And it is very similar with writing. If students are struggling to spell and to get the words on the page through handwriting or keyboarding. All this energy is going into that transcribing and they're not able to focus on the meat, which is being able to express in their composing what they wanna say in their writing. So that's the fastest overview you're going to see of the writing group. As we focus on summary, we're gonna to be touching a lot in the, in the top strand, critical thinking, a lot of critical thinking needed to be able to write a summary. But if students don't have good syntax or paragraph writing skills, that's gonna affect the quality of their summaries. Um, and certainly if they don't have solid transcription skills. All right, so let's now focus on the focus of the workshop. What is a summary? Um, it's basically a shorter condensed statement of the main ideas or events. And it could be a summary from anything that is read, said, or done. 
The example we're gonna work our way through here, and just as a reminder, make sure that you grab the handouts for, for this session because we're gonna be practicing doing a summary together. Um, so oftentimes people think summaries have to be about text and something that we're reading, but it really can be a summary of a lecture or um, you know, a process or anything that's happened in the classroom. Um, the thing that we wanna keep in mind, it, it is really focused on the big ideas, right? So either the main events, if you're summarizing something narrative, or the big ideas, main ideas, if you're summarizing informational uh, kinds of a kind of source. And while we do bring in a few details, it's not about the details. And that's really important. It's very different than a retail. A retail is tell everything back that you can remember including the main ideas and the details. Um, I think we also need to think about summarizing as a life skill. It's not just something we use in school. If we're out in the job or if we're out, we're out with friends, if you have the ability to quickly summarize something and explain it back to somebody, it, it's a tool that you're gonna use for the rest of your life, right? So being able to summarize to a friend the movie you just watched and why, why you recommend it, or being able to summarize to your to your boss, what went on in a meeting that, that your boss might have missed. So it, it's a really important tool, not just for school. I already mentioned the difference between summary and retail, um, but we should also talk about paraphrasing because that's similar to summary, right? It's like putting something in your own words. And the best, you know, the best summaries don't copy wording directly from the source, right? It's when students are able to put it into their own word, own words. Um, what's the length of a summary? It really can vary. If you're just summarizing two paragraphs, your summary might only be two or three sentences. If you're summarizing a whole article, um, maybe 15, 16 paragraphs, your summary might be one or two or even three paragraphs. Think about if we summarize a whole chapter in a book. So the length is gonna really vary depending on the source. And then the other thing I wanna say about a summary is it's a great formative assessment tool for teachers. If you ask students to summarize what they just learned in today's lesson, or to summarize the section they just read in their history textbook, right? You're able to determine whether they actually learned that information or not. So why should we teach it? Well, summarizing has been identified in both the research around reading comprehension as well as writing as an extremely helpful strategy. Um, I'll hit the mountaintops of that research in just a few minutes. So we know that it supports comprehension and writing. Now, I know that many of you who are tuned in today um, you know, are coming from lots of different states in the US and, and some of you are in different countries. My work and the work of my trainers when we're out in schools, we work in different states that have different state um, standards. So I will often refer to the common core standards. There are many states who use them. Many of the other states who have their own, they're very similar. So um, basically there is an entire reading standard, standard number two, devoted to summarizing. And it, it starts in K to three with retail, but by grade four, it is in every standard across the grades. And you see the word embedded right in there. Um, I also think that one of the writing standards is very connected to summarizing. Standard number eight, ask students to gather relevant information from sources, integrate the information while avoiding plagiarism. And basically, if you're grabbing a lot of information from a source or multiple sources, and you're trying to integrate it, you're going to need some summarizing skills. So that's a little bit about why we should teach it. Um, let's just make some references to some of the research that supports the importance of summarizing. One research meta-analysis report that came out um, in 2007 was called Writing Next. The authors and the team that, that reviewed all the research related to effective writing, things that we could do for writing to improve the writing of students in grades three to 12. Um, the authors identified 11 um, instructional practices that turned out to be highly um, effective. 
and they listed them in order. And I want you to see that which one comes in at number two, summarizing. Writing to read is another meta-analysis report. This looked at all the research there was about how writing affects reading or improves reading. Now, the report came out with three recommendations. The first was that when we have students write about what they read, it significantly improves their comprehension. That recommendation goes on to suggest the things, the types of writing that were most effective. And I want you to see once again, there you've got your summarizing coming in at number two. The National Reading Panel. Uh, I know it's getting old now, 2000, right? But in the section about, um, about comprehension, they identified eight kinds of instruction to improve comprehension and summarizing was one of them. So um, there's lots of research that supports the importance. One of the things about summarizing though, it's hard. It's hard to do and it's hard to teach. Um, you know, one of the, uh, the, the teacher training um, courses that I've authored, authored a long time ago is called the Key Comprehension Routine. And it's a, a, a routine that, that combines four major sort of strategies, right, that students use, using the top-down web before and during reading, two column notes, gen teaching kids to generate questions. But the fourth one is summarizing. And I will tell you that, you know, when we go back into schools after we've showed teachers how to teach these strategies, summarizing is the one they do the least. And I really believe because it's hard to teach and hard to do, but you get so much out of it. Um, I always like to say that if there was only one strategy I could teach students that would improve their reading and writing and help them be a better student, summarizing would be it. So we kind of reviewed the research on this. We can use summarizing to support comprehension, right? And I mentioned before, summarize anything read, said, or done. And by the way, your summaries don't even have to be written. They can be oral quick summaries. They can be done in any subject. I'm gonna show you some examples. Um, students generate these summaries both to help them comprehend and remember the information that they're summarizing. We also know that summarizing is going to be an essential tool when we're gathering information to write a formal writing assignment. So a little bit more about summary writing. Um, we need to explain to students that it is a very specific kind of writing task. Um, it's, it's different from other writing, right? It's not the same as an extended response, you know, like the type we get on high stakes state tests, right, where there's a prompt and you're supposed to search for information and write an answer to the response. Those kinds of, that kind of writing test, we need a lot of details. There, it's very different than your standard informational or narrative writing, right? In both of those kinds of writing assignments, students have to bring in a lot of detail. And it's also different from the argument um, where you have to bring in a lot of details around evidence. It's unique. It's a kind of writing that has one purpose and that is to summarize, right? The other thing about summarizing is um, it's really not designed for the student to uh, offer an opinion, right? Or to um, consider or write about what they think the author of the source meant. It's really expository writing. Oops, hold on a second, there we go. Um, Let's also put this in the context of, hold on, here we go, of uh, content writing in general, right? So a grade, cross grades four to 12, what we're gonna be talking here in this workshop, this is something that any teacher can and should teach and have students do. You know, oftentimes writing falls under the purview of English teachers or ELA teachers or, or those teachers specifically teaching writing. But, um, you know, these kinds of tasks are, are things that can support learning across every subject. And if all teachers in, across the subjects work in summarizing into their teaching, right? Integrate it into their content instruction. The students then are gonna find lots of opportunities to practice writing summaries 
about math and science and history and literature. And so they're gonna to get to that independent stage faster. So let's just talk about content writing. Um, this is a slide that I use that's part of my keys to content writing training course. Um, and basically in, in different subject areas, there's three categories or kinds of writing tasks. The first, quick writes. These are things that take less than 10 minutes. If I'm a middle school student and I have five main teachers, and if every one of those teachers does a quick write once or twice a week, I'm getting practice writing, even though it's short, five to 10 times. So they're very short, they're not graded, um, they're informal. On the opposite end, we have formal writing tasks. And often what I, you know, what I mean by this is, in the classroom, these are things that take multiple sessions, right? They could take a week or even more. The ob objective of these uh, kinds of writing tasks is to have students really deeply learn content or explore something, right? They're revised oftentimes multiple times. They're uh, formally evaluated. And this also leads to another kind of formal writing task. And that's the kinds of tasks we get on on-demand assessments, which are often timed. They're very formally evaluated and scored. But the middle column is where I think, um, besides quick writes, this is where most writing tasks in a subject area are going to land. And this is definitely where summarizing drops in. So this is a task that can take one or more sessions. Maybe you start it in the classroom, students finish it for homework. It's related to content, so they're gonna be writing summaries about what they're learning. The objective is to deepen understanding, right? And to make sure students really grasp the information. It might be revised, but it doesn't have to be. It might be graded in a formal way or informally. So now let's shift our focus a little to what can be summarized. Because as I mentioned at the start, oftentimes people think a summary has to be of text, but it does not. And so I'm gonna ask you if you haven't already been following along in your packet. And by the way, the packet, the first large chunk um, is more handouts that I've given you, but at the very back, I also have copies of the slides. So if you've got the handout packet handy, what I'd like you to do is to turn to uh, the page just after the writing rope. And you're going to see uh, a list of content summary tasks that move on to the next page. So we can summarize text, absolutely. And there's different kinds of text. So we could expository and expository text, we could summarize a whole textbook chapter or a section, right? Or an article. When it comes to narrative, summaries um, often turn out to be a plot summary. So we're gonna summarize all the events in a chapter or in a short story. Um, but we can also summarize specific literary elements. So we might write a summary of the main characters or of the main settings. We could write a summary of the key theme or multiple themes or a summary of the problem and solution. Um, now let's think about non-text. We can write a summary of a science lab experiment. We can write the summary of a process, the process you follow to do something in, in um, maybe in woodshop in high school. Uh, we can summarize an event, summarize a video, a lecture, or a discussion. So the point with this slide is don't limit teaching students to write summaries just about what they read. Let's take a moment now, and I want you to skim over that page that I mentioned that has a bunch of examples of summary writing tasks that have been assigned by teachers. Um, I put this list together from various classrooms where when we're teaching summarizing, we often ask student teachers to share with us their summarizing uh, assignments. So just take a moment and find the subject that you teach in um, or pick a subject that interests you and just take a look at just how varied the different kinds of things that can be summarized can be. Um, and while we're doing that, see if you can come up with what's one thing that you teach students that you could ask them to summarize. Um, and I do hope when the workshop is over that you um, maybe think about this, come back, take a few minutes and, and go back to these pages and try a summary test with your students next week. All right, 
So that's a little bit about the background about summarizing. Um, let's shift gears now and focus on some instructional suggestions. How do you teach this and have students practice? So first of all, we need to make sure that students know what a summary is and what it's not. A lot of students don't understand that. They don't get the concept. And I will say, actually, a lot of teachers aren't sure themselves. I've been in schools where we'll be working with teachers and um, they'll say, oh, yes, I had the students summarize this and then they show me what they did. And while they called it a summary, they actually were expecting students to do a different kind of writing task. So we want to make sure we're all on the same page about what a summary is. Next, since summary is so dependent on the big ideas and not a lot of detail, we need to make sure that students have the underlying main idea skills, we can call them that, um, that allow them to pull from the source what the big ideas are and see the difference between them and relevant details, right? So that they can um, start to make a list. It's almost like a pre-writing summarizing list that focuses on the main ideas. We need to constantly point out to students that a summary is different than other kinds of writing tasks. And I reviewed that um, earlier. We want to give them models and explicit instruction and then give them guided practice for how to generate a summary from both text and non-text situations. In many ways, it's easier to write a summary from a text because you can keep going back and rereading. If you're writing a summary from a video or a lecture or a discussion, it's gone and it's very hard to hear it again unless you've, you've taped it, right? So writing from uh, summaries from text is a good place to start. Uh, we also want to share with them planning tools and scaffolds that will help make their summarizing go well. So that's what we need to teach them. And we want to make sure we avoid something I call a suicide, right? We can't assume that students have these skills already under their belt. Um, another thing I want to point out is that summarizing is one of those things that it's not like addition. You know, once students learn to add numbers, you know, never have to go back and reteach it, right? Summarizing is something that while the fundamentals you can introduce in the earlier grades, in the elementary grades, what happens is as students move from grade to grade, um, the, the complexity of what they have to summarize um, really ramps up. And so just because a student can write a good summary in fourth grade, it doesn't mean they're gonna be able to write a good summary in sixth grade or a good summary of something in physics class and you know, in grade 11. So we, we, we do wanna keep coming back. Um, one of the, the scaffolds we can do for students is to start by teaching them how to write a sum, summary about something very basic, like what are the four, write a summary of the four seasons. This way they're learning the craft, the, the process of writing a summary um, and can focus on that instead of trying to write about something that's new to them. We wanna use a lot of modeling and think aloud and we wanna provide those scaffolds. So I'm going to show you a video now. I find when I, when I talk about this, about this topic in a, a webinar like this, it's very hard to model this. So I happen to have a, a video of this metaphor. So I'm just gonna play it for you. Um, if you're interested in, in accessing this video, um, it is available on YouTube. Uh, you know, on the front of your handout packet, I've given you a link to um, the Keys to Literacy Resource Center, where we have a lot of free archive videos and webinars, and that, that's where, you're, where you'll find this. So I'll just click on the video and let it explain itself. So as we've said before, the, the concept of a summary um, is difficult for some kids to wrap their head around. Um, they often get it confused with um, a retail, so uh, they start to write about everything that they can remember. Um, and we're going to use a metaphor. We're going to use a sponge, actually, as a metaphor to uh, help explain the concept of a summary. So I have right now a sponge, and it's in a bucket of water here, a, a bowl of water. And so it's it's pretty heavy with water. In fact, you know, we're we're watching the water sort of drip out of it. Um, and in this form, the sponge represents whatever 
I'm going to be summarized. So maybe I'm going to summarize a movie. The sponge with all the water in it represents everything I saw in the movie. Or maybe I'm going to summarize a meeting I went to. Um, the sponge represents everything that's in the meeting. Or maybe I'm going to summarize an article that I just read. And the sponge represents everything that's in the article, the big ideas, the details, the pictures, everything that's in it. Or maybe I've just read a chapter in a novel. So that's the, the, the topic for the summary. But when we summarize, um, we don't give back everything. We are really just focusing on the main ideas, the most important ideas, or if it's a story, the most important events that happen. Um, and in order to do that, the first thing kids need to be able to do is identify what are the big details, the big ideas, versus what are all the supporting details, um, and make a distinction between those. So if we were to use the concept of our wet sponge as representing everything that we're going to be summarizing, when we summarize, we literally start to squeeze the sponge, right? With it's a metaphor for we start to think about or comprehend what we just saw in the movie or we just read, right? And what we try to do is get rid of all the water, which represents the details. So the what's left, the, the form of the sponge, this is the main ideas, the big events. And we've just hopefully gotten rid of a lot of the details. And so now when we are, we, we just squeezed them out, right? We're down at our sort of our bare bones main points. Now, when we go to say or write our summary, we have to take those basic ideas and blow them up a little bit. We turn them into full sentences. Um, we usually start by telling somebody what the sponge is about, meaning what's the summary about. And then we proceed to explain the big ideas, not with not very many details. Now, what's nice about this metaphor is sometimes students they don't squeeze out enough of the water. And so when they give you a summary and it's too long and they're going on and on and on, right? You can say, your sponge still, your sponge still has too much water in it. You need to get rid of some of the details, okay? The other thing that can happen is sometimes the sponge, um, they only give us four of the five big ideas. They're missing a few. And so in that case, you can say, you only gave me part of the sponge. Where's the rest of the main ideas? Um, so, and sometimes they can just give you almost like a list of main ideas and they need, really need to embellish it a little bit more. And so that's when you might say, you know what, you need to make the sponge a little more moist. You got to put a few details back in there in order for it to, you know, to be a, a, a good summary. So, so I'm going to end it there. Um, and uh, I will tell you, I've been using this metaphor for 35 years uh, with students. Sometimes students, we have to actually bring in sponge, right? And make it multi-sensory. But eventually the sponge goes away and it's the concept that you want kids to, to remember. Um, summarizing, also we wanna think about this. It, it, it combines both writing and comprehension. The reason it's so difficult for so many students is that they might be falling apart on the comprehension end. They might not be understanding what they have to summarize or might not be able to identify the main ideas. It could be falling apart on the writing side. Maybe they get it, but they don't have very good sentence writing, so they can't express what they want to say. And it also could be an executive function issue where they're just not able to organize the ideas to present them. So when students are having difficulty with summaries, you really want to try to parse out what's the underlying cause. Now, um, this is one of the, the, the first uh, activities, or I'm sorry, handouts that um, I, I want you to make sure you're looking at in your packet, right? Um, I've been using this for decades now. Um, you can also download a, an electronic copy of this uh, from, from the free resources at the Keys to Literacy website. But basically, it's a set of steps. Now, ultimately, you want these to become embedded so the kids just automatically follow them. But many students who aren't sure about writing summaries benefit from seeing this list, you know, maybe in a handout or in an anchor chart in the classroom. You're basically telling them to start by first distinguishing the main ideas from the details, then capturing those main ideas, write them down in phrase form. 
Then start to write your summary by including an introductory statement. Tell the reader what you're summarizing. Then carefully take each main idea, develop it into a sentence, include a little bit of details, right? Add a little bit of water into the sponge. You can at some point combine some of the sentences, then make sure you use transition words, right? First, next, however, they're really gonna make the summary flow. And then as a last step, make sure you proofread. Now there's a simpler little uh, you know, acronym to help kids remember these steps it's called MIST, main ideas, introductory sentence, sentences with the main ideas, transitions added. Now, another scaffold that I've included in your handout packet is a list of transition words. These things really make writing, any kind of writing flow, right? They're also really an important comprehension tool. As students are reading, if they come across a transition, that transition is going to give them um, a clue to help them make meaning. Now, this list that I'm sharing with you, I have been giving to students for over 35 years. Before the internet, I used to get letters from my old students saying, I lost my list, can you send me one now? It's great, I can just post this on my website and literally thousands of people download it every month. So it's yours, um, take it, use it. Uh, if you teach younger grades and you feel like this one has got too many, it's overwhelming, I also have one for the primary grades. All right. So let's just, with this slide, I wanted to show you a couple examples from the classroom of summaries where the students are purposely putting in the transitions. You can see uh, there's the example on the right, the student has highlighted them. Uh, the example on the left, the student has circled them. They really help make a summary flow. Now, um, let's delve just a little bit more into the main idea concept here because it really is reliant on the ability to find those main events or main ideas. If we are reading a paragraph, the main idea is most likely going to be found in the topic sentence if, if there's one. So if you're writing a summary of a paragraph, your summary is only going to basically be one sentence. If you're writing a summary of multiple paragraphs, you want to grab the main ideas from each paragraph and that's what's going to form the core of your summary. If you're doing a narrative, you're going to jot down the main idea of events in order, and that's going to drive your narrative summary, um, and so on and so forth. If you have a topic web, like all the big topics represented in a graphic organizer, those topics are going to help you generate a summary. I'm going to show you an example in a minute. If you have two column notes, Two column notes, that format has main ideas in the left side, details on the right. Well, those main ideas in the left side are going to drive your, um, your summary. And then finally, if it's non-text like a lecture or a discussion, you want to grab a list of what were the big ideas or topics that were spoken. Um, let's talk about a few scaffolds for this. One scaffold is to scaffold the actual source if it's text. So how might you do this? You can take the text, break it up in the sections. And so we're going to um, actually take a peek for the first time at a source that I've got for you. So if you don't mind jumping ahead in your packets, um, about 10 pages, and you're gonna come to an article, it's two pages. It says practice text, grade level five, all right? So this is some text. Uh, it's about an island in the Pacific that is uninhabited, but has more garbage floating onto the island than any other place in the world. It's a fascinating article. I want you to take a look at the text and see how I have annotated it or, or scaffolded it for the students. I basically took each chunk, there are four chunks in this article, and I've put them into a section bracketed it, numbered them. So you've got one, two, three, four. At the end of each section, I've got a box where the student, after reading the three or four paragraphs above, would state the main idea of that section. I've actually given you the first one is filled in. So that's one scaffold. Another thing we can do is point out headings. The headings in text very often give clues to main ideas. 
And then finally, for those students that need an extra scaffold, the teacher can go into the text and actually underline sentences or phrases where the main idea is stated and or jot the main idea out in the margin. So those are some ways to scaffold the source. There are several other scaffolds that you can use. Um, one is, as I mentioned, um, a top-down web. I'll show you that example. You can also do two column notes or I'll show you a summary template. But if you don't have any of these, that's fine. At the very least, just have students make a list of the main ideas. The first thing that happened, the second thing that happened, right? So um, let me show you a quick example of that. This is from a classroom. The students were uh, reading um, a, a, a novel, uh, Lord of the Flies. And so they had to write a chapter of the events that happened in the summer and you can, in a, in a chapter, you can see how the student has listed the four main ideas. Then I want you to look at each main idea and see how the student developed each one into a sentence. Notice how there's a little bit of detail added, right? Um, and then I've highlighted the transitions in red because I want you to see how powerful they can be in helping to drive the summary. Um, so one of the other scaffolds I mentioned to you was a summary template. Um, you have a copy of this in your handout packet. It's also, along with the transition words, one of those electronic handouts that you can download for free from the Keys to Literacy website. You, you, you wanna go to the, it's called free printables and downloads. So let's, let's look at how this could be a, a scaffold for students. At the top, there's space for them to list their main ideas, right? Next, that space and a reminder to kick off your summary by writing the, the introductory sentence you're going to use. Third, take each one of the main ideas, develop them into a sentence. This is where you bring in a little bit of detail, right? Number four, don't forget the transitions. And we've actually included a handful of the most basic ones right on the template. And then a reminder to summary. Now, let me just say this. If you have students who really struggle with writing or maybe have dysgraphia, right? I know a lot of teachers who will accept a completed template like this as the finished summary, or you can have them go on to actually rewrite a final draft of the summary. And so here you see an example of a student summary template um, and then the finished product over on the right. Again, I've bolded the transitions so you can see how helpful that is. I mentioned about a top-down topic web, um, and this is something, this is a tool that's more of a comprehension tool, but um, so I just wanna briefly introduce it to you. Um, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about this, uh, I think there was a blog that I wrote a couple, uh, couple years back um, on my, my literacy line blogs, you have a link to that. And there's also an archived webinar of me explaining top-down topic webs if you wanna learn a little bit more. But let me just model, to just use this example. So uh, this was a classroom. The students were, were uh, reading the novel To Kill a Mockingbird. The task was to um, summarize how the character demonstrates courage. And so you can see the students used a top-down web to identify three instances in the novel where the, uh, the character demonstrated uh, courage. Now, I'm gonna show you on the next slide Let's just pay attention here. You see blue, that's the big topic, but there were three examples. So now let's see how it mapped out into the summary. Blue, first sentence, because that's the introduction telling us what the summary is about. But then I want you to see how each one of the yellow items in the web got blown up into a sentence. The student added a little bit of detail, and then you can see the, um, the transitions. All right, here you're going to see a student's uh, sample of this. So the students got this web, uh, decided to write about Patrick Henry. And I want you to see how the students put check marks next to those things that are going to find their way into the summary. And then the color coding is continued. So introductory sentence is blue. Um, all of the items that were the main ideas are in red and then the details are in green. So another tool that you can use is um, two column notes. I'm a big fan of this. I use it for a lot of things. It's part of our comprehension routine. We use it in our content writing training. 
But let's take a look at a very simple example here. So here we have um, some notes that were taken from a, a very basic article about floods. This was an elementary example. Uh, there are basically four main paragraphs. The student has listed the main ideas down the left side, right? Different causes and lots of details on the right. Now let's remember a summary is not a retell of everything, right? We want, we want to keep the number of details we use to a minimum. So what I've done here to make them pop out for you is I've highlighted everything that, find, that, that will find their way into the summary on the next slide. So all the main ideas are highlighted because we have to include all of the main ideas, but only one or two details for each is what, what's in the summary. So here you see the summary, topic sentence is green representing the topic. Uh, remember, four main ideas in red, and there you see the four main ideas in red with a little bit of detail added and our transitions. Here's a more a complex one. This was from a middle school. Students were learning about the colonists. There's the three main ideas in red, many details in blue, but we're only going to use a few of them. And here you see it all coming out into the summary. So it's very, um, it's very strategic way of moving from pre-writing organizers into a summary. Uh, here's another one. This was uh, main characters. You'll see the three main characters and then, oops, nope. Sorry, I don't have the, I don't, I don't have the summary for it. But basically you, your summary, you wanna make sure you have all three characters in just one or two things, one or two details. All right, so more scaffolds. We wanna introduce summarizing using everyday example. Like I said earlier, maybe have them write a summary of the four, four seasons of the year, right? Um, practice with very short summaries from short sources, do them orally at first, maybe a ticket out the door. Um, chunk the text, provide the main ideas. We talked about that. Another technique is to provide a partially completed summary. This is very helpful, especially for students who are learning English. And so they don't, might not have a lot of language. Uh, this is a, a, a highly scaffolded example, but you can see the teachers provided the summary and the student only has to add in a few key details. All right. So now we're gonna spend our, a few more minutes here with me showing you an example of an actual um, a summary assignment. One of the things we're gonna introduce is something called a WAG. It's a writing assignment guide. You have a blank WAG and you have some many examples in there of WAGs. Uh, I find that if I share this planning tool with teachers and all you need to do is see a few examples like you have in your, um, activity packet. So for example, there's one for history and language arts and science and physics. Take a look at how these other teachers used these WAGs to create a, a very clear writing task to students, right? Where all the um, uh, uh, directions, requirements are listed, requirements for length. Uh, WAG is a great tool um, to make sure that your students really know what you expect in a writing task. Uh, you also have the handout that has these questions that will help you create a writing assignment guide. Um, and part of this, uh, the guide is to make clear for students what the audience, the task, and the purpose is. So as the little box on the bottom says, take a look at the sample WAGs. I'll let you do that on your own time. All right. So let's put this all together and practice with a summarizing task. Uh, teachers wanna first identify a source. I've got one for you. It's that article about Henderson Island. Then the teachers wanna create a WAG that gets very specific about the summarizing task. And I have one for you for that. And then we wanna decide what are the scaffolds we're gonna provide. So our practice source is Henderson Island. You've already hopefully looked at that. Here's an example of what the WAG might look like. And you have this in your handout packet as well. So the task is to write a summary about how it's being overrun by seafaring trash. We've got an audience, we've got a purpose, we've got guidelines about length, this is not gonna be that long. And we've got very specific directions. The student first has to take some two column notes then the student is going to use the main ideas in the left side of the notes to drive the summary. They are expected to use transitions. 
and to refer to the summary checklist, that, that list of how-tos that I showed you. Now, what's nice about doing this electronically with students is you can add hyperlinks. So this gives you a hyperlink to the list of the transitions. This gives you a hyperlink to the how to write a summary, right? So that gives you a sense of what the WAG looks like. Um, now, very briefly, let me show you how this might play out into two column notes. So we write our main topic across the top. Down the left side, we're going to list each main idea. Remember, there were four sections, so there's a main idea for each one. We already scaffolded the text by having the student tell us what the main idea, write it in for each section. So that's going to go on the left side. Now, because this is a summary, they're not going to take notes on all the details, only one or two. So as this plays out, the very first main idea um, is that Henderson Island is not inhabited, but there's a lot of plastic. And then you can see a bunch of details on the right. We continue to do this for each part of the Henderson Island. Now, I'm gonna take a little side jaunt here and also show you how as we follow these steps in the summary, we're also following the stages of the writing process. You have a copy of the writing process. This is something that you wanna share with students for any writing, not just summarizing. So if we think about the stages in the writing process and we're working our way through this summary task, basically as the students figure out the main ideas and get them down in the phrase form, that's the thinking and planning. Now they're gonna to start to write their summary. So they're gonna give us an introductory statement. They're gonna turn the main ideas into sentences, combine them and add some transitions. That's the right stage. And then they're finally going to revise. So let's begin to see how this plays out. I know we're getting tight on time here. So um, our opening statement is gonna tell us what the summary is about, right? Then we're gonna take each main idea from the left side of the notes and add a few details and develop a paragraph. This is very similar to the summaries I was showing you before. So there's your intro, tells the main idea. We add a few details and we add our transition. Here's the completed summary, by the way. So there were four sections, four main topics, main ideas. We have a paragraph for each one. All right, the last thing I'm gonna share with you, and this is in your handout packet, is we also wanna make sure we're giving students feedback. So the teacher can give feedback, but we can also use a tool such as this. We call this a self or a peer feedback checklist. We've got copies of this also um, and at the free printables section. And so you can see this is basically asking a student, it's very specific to look at the writing piece. Are each of these things present? If they're not, what could you do to help the student make the piece better? If they are, what's something you could do in a very tangible way to highlight what's going well in the summary? All right. So um, I'm going to end there because it's time for our questions and answers. There's a lot of information in your packet that you can go back over. And like I said, please um, follow up and grab some of the three free materials. You've got links here on the slide.